All right. Thank you very much, Anita, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank the organizers and especially Elsevier and Art Ellis for the opportunity to speak in front of this, uh, this group, which uh, is really an honor. Uh, we at the National Science Foundation have uh, just sort of down the street a ways <laughs> across the river, uh, have an agency that has eight scientific and educational directorates, including uh, mathematics and physical sciences, where I sit on the ninth floor in chemistry, but all the way over to the EDU, Directorate for Education, and the SB, the Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences, with engineering, geo, and bio, and computer science, and others in between. So this audience seems like a perfect NSF audience. And I hope to tell you something about what we're doing uh, in the chemistry division, but a little bit broader, uh, projecting forward. And if uh, I take an NSF, and I want to say that all the views that are expressed here are mine and not those of the National Science Foundation. So I absolutely need that disclaimer. But I will point to things happening at NSF. Uh, the National Science Board oversees uh, the mission of the agency. Uh, and the director, who's a presidential appointee, Setha Raman Panchanathan, currently uh, meets with the NSB uh, to get their wisdom. And the NSB, in its infinite wisdom, put forward the tw uh, Vision 2030, which I think it's very hard to read. I apologize for the small text. But you're going to see, I'll talk about things like TIP, the new directorate in NSF, an entirely new floor of the building that Dr. Panchanathan has created, and I think it's guided very much by Vision 2030, which talks about things like greater partnerships across the academy with, in fact, industry. And around the beltway, agencies like NSF should not be siloed, but should interact with other agencies. The NIH was mentioned in the introduction. I'll give you some examples of that. The EPA, the DOE, even the FDA, and... Um, even the Department of Homeland Security, if we really um, communicate better, we can perhaps know better what each of our scientific and engineering and educational domains include, and not just avoid duplication, but promote synergy. And I think that's part of the vision here in Vision 2030. Uh, Dr. Panchanathan likes to talk about the three pillars of the NSF. The one on the left here is, strangely, the established NSF is protecting the core. We at NSF are an agency created by the federal government by Congress in 1950, just after World War II, to make sure that monies, and at this point we're a $9 to $10 billion agency, that monies are allocated to support bottom-up, curiosity-driven fundamental research, and that is the core, and that is the left pillar. The second one is inspiring the missing millions. This is particularly, my talk will be particularly focused on the United States since we're shepherding that money as federal taxpayer money from the U.S. We are a melting pot, an experiment in progress here in the United States, and yet we have not actualized the diversity of our population in the scientific enterprise, not even close. And that's where inspiring the missing millions comes from and is motivated toward uh, and then accelerating technology innovation is very much aligned with the vision of the current director and this notion uh, of, of greater collaboration, particularly with the private sector moving forward. So this is Ponch. He likes to go by Ponch as it's his nickname. Uh, and this is his vision. It had been 30 years since a new directorate had been established at NSF. Uh, so that was a bold vision. Um, and that we're about a year and a half into the standing up of TIP. It has not fully stood up financially, certainly. Last year, we had a record budget of $10 billion for the agency. Uh, that came crashing down. This year, we have a record budget cut, and we're at $9 billion, and we're working with that right now. And that is simply a fact. That's very recent. The budget was just agreed upon by the two houses of Congress. The uh, largest... Uh, a uh, mechanism that's come forward from TIP is these regional innovation engines you see on this slide. The notion here is to fund collaborative ventures of academics, industry partners, even state and local governments, even venture capitalists, to come together to attack a grand societal, a societal grand challenge. And there are 10 of these have been funded just this year for the first two years. The vision is these could go if they go for 10 years, they'd be as large as $160 million investment. So this is a bold new way of funding research, again, to foster these, the notion of partnerships. 
Also on this slide are the so-called emerging industries. We at NSF are in the executive branch of government, so we report up through the director, Ponch, to the presidential science advisor, Arati Prabhakar, who was previously head of DARPA, and she is now not just the presidential science advisor, but the head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, right next to the White House in the beautiful Eisenhower Executive Office Building, if you have a chance to take a walk down the street a bit. And we actually meet there physically when I meet with my OSTP committee, though we're on Zoom far too much. OSTP puts out a priority memory each year, and these so-called industries of the future, in the spirit of this conference, or now emerging industries, are articulated. And while advanced manufacturing sounds uh, old-fashioned, Ideas like the electrification of manufacturing and thinking more about sustainability, we'll talk about that in a moment, are emerging themes in advanced manufacturing. AI has been a theme everywhere around this conference as it should be, and it's a theme at NSF. Biotechnology was mentioned in the introduction. That's also an old term, but the ways we think about um, manipulating biological systems now, particularly with innovations such as CRISPR and uh, next generation sequencing, and really the human proteome project, all of these things are going to lead, are we're going to revolutionize biology at a very fundamental level and lead to much more personalized medicine. That's very much front and center in what we're doing. QIS, quantum information science, uh, also uh, definitely projecting out in the future. We think about quantum sensing and quantum computing and these technologies have not been realized. But in the next 10 years, we're going to see major advancements there, and we're investing heavily there. And then things like climate solutions, sustainable chemistry, and clean energy fit under the rubric of towards a resilient planet at NSF. And these are large problems that will require interdisciplinary collaborations. And from the publishing space may make you think a little bit differently about how this work should be, uh, should be uh, put forward and disseminated to the community. I wanted to highlight one of the things that uh, I've personally worked on in my time in the chemistry division at NSF. We looked at the Nobel Prize in chemistry, and while Marie uh, Skłodowska-Curie is uh, an idol and a role model to many women, women were not recognized uh, very much at all in the chemistry Nobel Prize until recently. And we look at Carolyn Bertozzi recently sharing the Nobel Prize for bioorthogonal chemistry, Francis Arnold for a directed evolution of enzymes. Um, and we look at the uh, beautiful work on uh, CRISPR technology, for example. These are three separate Nobel Prizes. Uh, there are at least four women represented there. Um, and these are the frontiers of biotechnology, and yet these are chemistry Nobel Prizes. So seeing that, we said chemistry should lead a new initiative for high-risk, high-payoff research in biotechnology that is molecular in nature. And if you can see it on this slide, there have been three themes. The first related to the fully expressed proteome and protein trafficking. The second very much AI inspired, inspired by developments like AlphaFold and RosettaFold that use the data repository of the protein data bank as the database for a machine learning inspired approach to how do we predict de novo protein folding and protein shapes, and hopefully at some point protein function. And the most recent one uh, is focused on RNA science and has become now a collaboration, in fact, with six divisions across four directorates at NSF and with the NHGRI at NIH. And we all partner and we all put our funds together uh, and uh, we'll be funding about a dozen uh, awards that we think are really beautiful science in the RNA science space. The NSF ones have all been announced. The NIH ones will be announced shortly. They have council to deal with. Uh, so this is the uh, a different look at sort of the high priority areas. And I want to focus my next slides on AI and sustainable chemistry, but also semiconductor research, as you know, has become very important. Um, and this slide focuses a little bit on the most recent physics Nobel Prize. We just heard a talk from the APS, uh, and that was very much, and that was shared across the pond with a couple of French investigators and one at Ohio State, Pierre Augustini, uh, and uh, Anne uh, Huillier from France. Um, and and this, this was on eight, at a second uh, spectroscopy, and we are standing up at NSF, well, through NSF funding at the Ohio State University, 
Nexus, which will be an Addo second laser facility, which is almost ready uh, for operation and will allow one to think about, to examine uh, semiconductor defects, for example, and really think uh, at a very uh, local level about how semiconductors might be designed. In the area of sustainable chemistry, uh, the Congress in the, uh, you can barely see it here on the left side of the screen, in the National Defense Authorization Act of 2021, believe it or not, uh, required codified in law that OSTP must stand up a sustainable chemistry strategy team and report back to Congress on what the federal agencies in the United States are doing in this space. Of course, we had to define sustainable chemistry first. <laughs> that took uh, months. Uh, and the definition, if you want to look at this report, you can Google it and take a look, uh, is quite long and tries to encompass the, um, the ways in which each of these agencies uh, sees itself in sustainable chemistry. I co-chair this group with Kate Beers at NIST. She's a brilliant polymer chemist and leads the circular economy program at NIST. And you can see we have about a dozen federal agencies who have come together. The first report was released in August of last year. We are now working on the strategic plan. Uh, many things come into our thinking about sustainable chemistry from the point of view of fundamental science to change the efficiency of chemical transformations, relates to the electrification of manufacturing, to use photochemistry and transduce solar energy more efficiently, to thinking about the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, but the FDA and the EPA are there as well, and they'd like us to not just use AI to dry, drive more efficient design of processes in chemistry, but to design safer chemicals. So the toxicity part and the environmental impact part are a part of sustainable chemistry as well. This is how broad it is. So I encourage you to take a look at that report to see more. But sustainable chemistry also talks to clean energy technologies. The DOE is huge on the hydrogen economy. We'll see how, how far that goes in the future. There's a lot of potential there. Burning hydrogen is awfully clean. You get water, but hydrogen has other challenges, right? Um, and then we think about climate solutions. That is, if there ever were a bold goal, that is a bold goal that we all think about every day. We think about the carbon cycle. We think about um, how we power our vehicles, how we, uh, how we behave every day in society. And so even social and behavioral uh, sciences will be very important for climate solutions. Uh, this, at NSF in chemistry, we have a center. I was mentioned in the introduction. I'm about to head to the Center for Sustainable Polymers today. That's in Minnesota. This is one of our newer centers, the Center for Organic Electrochemistry, led by Shelley Mintier and, and Phil Barron at Scripps as a major player. They're really trying to reinvent chemistry from thermally driving chemical reactions to driving them with electrons. And ultimately, if you can transduce solar and improve battery technology, you're indirectly using solar to power reactions rather than, say, thermal, rather than coal. Uh, and we would like to begin from sustainable and renewable building blocks. So much of the chemical industry and chemistry comes from petrochemicals, comes from essentially you know, billions of years of sort of stored carbon and, and fossil fossil uh, sources. Can we use nature and biotechnology and then creativity to uh, repurpose and reinvent the, the, the educts and the, uh, the starting materials uh, for our chemical processes? This is one that makes acrylates from lactic acid. AI will be incredibly important as many have stated at this meeting. Uh, we have a number of investments at the National Science Foundation related to AI. Uh, such as the NAIRR, which is meant to be a national resource for AI instruments through sort of a one-stop shopping place where people can deposit useful uh, tools for AI, uh, as well as a cloud bank project, an advanced computing center, um, and then uh, an open knowledge network. So this is, this is a very active area of conversation at the foundation. We in chemistry have an AI institute called the Molecule Maker Laboratory Instrument uh, Institute, sorry, or MMLI. This is at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. 
uh, led by a synthetic biologist, Kyumin Zhao, who's a Francis Arnold protege, and uh, some synthetic chemists such as Marty Burke, Scott Denmark. They are trying to democratize synthesis to come up with ways where machine learning with the data available, which is a huge problem in chemistry, are what are the data sets and how are they shared? This is, is very important. This is what these folks are partially working on. How can those be harnessed to more intelligently design reactions and, and then automate them? Uh, we have also, these centers are $20 million investments over five years. They're called the CCIs, the Centers for Chemical Innovation. We have seven of them that are active now, and I've been showing you a number of one number of them. And CCAS is literally the Center for Computer Assisted Synthesis led by Olaf Wiest at Notre Dame. And one of the stars in this group is Abby Doyle now at UCLA. Uh, and she's using things like Bayesian algorithms and the bandit optimization model uh, to think about designing chemistry. The bandit optimization model is how a really good gambler at Las Vegas finds the best slot machine, but she just published in Nature how you can use that same type of thinking to look at conditions for a chemical reaction and optimize. So uh, if you want an interesting conversation, find uh, Abby Doyle at uh, UCLA. I'm very proud to support her. And then our friends in the uh, Division of Mathematical Sciences are exceptionally excited about digital twins. Digital twins, as I think has been mentioned by others, have the potential to be applied all across society, from medicine to manufacturing, to power, to wind farms, to smart cities. I think if we look forward in the next 10 years, there's no doubt that digital twins will be incredibly important. As I mentioned, partnerships are a huge emphasis at the National Science Foundation right now, uh, and government would like to catalyze partnerships across the private and academic sectors. One of the things we've done in chemistry is to convene a workshop with the chemical industry as many players as who wanted to come. And this was done in November of 2022. And I was hoping to be able to tell you to announce this new solicitation, but it's not quite through the last signature electronically at NSF. But within the next couple of weeks, you should see the first ever solicitation between NSF chemistry and the chemical industry. Five companies are involved. Uh, they are leaders. I can't say more, but again, you'll see this soon. And they are putting real money into an area that they've defined as pre-competitive space that we agree is a future leaning theme related to sustainable chemistry, also related to AI. So I think you'll really appreciate that. And we hope this is the beginning of a much greater partnership. Europe is ahead of the United States in industrial academic collaborations. We could talk about that. That's something uh, we're sort of you know, we could take a lesson perhaps from what is going on in Europe there. And speaking of Europe, we also are reaching out internationally and we have collaborative calls with the Deutsche Forschung Gemeinschaft. We've done this now with three different themes and we're in very active discussions with them about the next steps. And we've just started working with the Agence Nationale de la Recherche in France. And we have a call that they are leading on catalysis with earth abundant elements. And we also have a a collaboration with the uh, Binational Science Foundation. Uh, and finally, I just want to end by saying uh, the missing millions, a theme I mentioned at the begin beginning, is a huge challenge for us. How do we diversify the scientific, technology, engineering, and mathematics workforce of the future, particularly in the U.S., where we have such an opportunity to tap into uh, both genders, all genders, um, and to uh, all ethnicities, particularly those traditionally underrepresented in science here, such as Hispanic and Latinx uh, Americans and Black and African Americans. And we, we uh, are trying to do a lot more in that space. This slide is busy. I really want to highlight one thing, which is called the Partnerships for Research and Education in Chemistry, PREC. It's based on PREM, which is the material science version of this. These are grants that go directly to a minority serving institution at the $1 million level or the $2 million level to partner with our centers for chemical innovation. Uh, we've made several of those. We hope that will make a difference. We have to move the needle a lot more. We've just really started, but there are a number of new mechanisms we've stood up. And so I'd like to conclude by uh, reminding us of those three pillars. Um, and I hope I've given you some reflection on what NSF is at its core what we would like to do to inspire the missing millions, and where we're going in this technology and innovation space and some of the frontiers uh, in which we wish to invest. Thank you very much for your attention.